reunión que tenemos con el profesor Niklas Luhmann, que todos nosotros, pienso, conocemos, pero no tenemos, tido, eh, tenemos hemos tenido todavía el placer de encontrar muchos de, no, de nosotros. Desgraciadamente, el profesor Arnaud, el director del instituto, no ha podido estar presente hoy, eh, por eso me ha encargado de, eh, de la responsabilidad de esta reunión y de transmitirles y de transmitir en especial al profesor Niklas Luhmann sus excusas por, por su ausencia. Yo pienso que lo que se va a pasar ahora es un momento clave, sin generación, en la sociología del derecho, considerando la importancia de los debates que, hay habido, que ha habido en vuelta de la obra de Niklas Luhmann en los últimos años. Años. Por eso me parece importante, eh, si es posible, en muy poco tiempo, que no quería eh, tirar al profesor Luhmann, pero en muy poco tiempo, decir algunas palabras sobre el itinerario de Niklas Luhmann y la problemática que va a abordar hoy, para bien ubicar el debate que ahora se va a tener y para que se aproveche mejor este momento. Los primeros trabajos de Niklas Luhmann fueron, fueron publicados en el, al principio de los años 60, en un momento en que Niklas Luhmann tenía colaboraciones en particular con Talcott Parsons, es importante referirlo, porque Talcott Parsons tuvo una importancia notable para el trabajo de Niklas Luhmann. Al final de los años 60 y en el principio, al principio de los años 70, publica en particular dos trabajos que son clásicos de la sociología jurídica moderna, que es uno, la legitimación por el procedimiento, que todos nosotros conocemos, y la muy conocida Rechtssoziologie, que tengo aquí en la edición original de 72, que ha sido traducida en muchas, muchas idiomas, en particular en inglés, una traducción que pueden consultar aquí en la biblioteca. Es en este periodo, en principio de los años 70, que el profesor Luhmann también tiene un muy conocido debate con Jürgen Habermas, un debate que ha sido publicado por la editora, por la editora Surkamp, eh, traducido en italiano, pero no conozco muchas traducciones, un debate que es un momento eh, muy importante, crucial, en la historia de, la, de las ciencias sociales eh, en la Alemania. A partir de este momento, Niklas Luhmann va a, va a sistematizar sus conceptos en una teoría más general, al abordar eh, nuevos campos como, la, como el campo político, y eh, hay diversos trabajos sobre el Estado Providencia, que ha publicado en Alemania y en otros países, y sobre las actitudes hacia los riesgos ecológicos, etc., pero también trabajos sobre campos muy diferentes, así como eh, la religión y el amor. A partir de este, eh, de este trabajo de generalización, ha podido, ha formulado eh, su teoría en un libro que eh, le, da una, le da una forma acabada, o sea, así se puede decir, que es su Uh, yo voy a decir en alemán primero, Soziales Systeme, Grundrisse einer Allgemeinen Theorie, publicado en 84 en la Alemania, 
eh, lo que, los que quiere decir eh, sistemas sociales, principios, eh, fundamentos para una teoría general, un libro que ha sido recientemente publicado en España eh, con el título Sociedad y Sistema, eh, tal como pueden ver en el e país de hace 10 de días, se si quieren ver la referencia. Es de, en el contexto de eh, esta teoría que se ubica la problemática hoy abordada, que es cómo se puede pensar el derecho en el contexto de esta teoría general. Y simplificando mucho, eh, lo que se eh, formula es que el derecho tiene que ser considerado como un sistema que tiene la particularidad de garantizar por sí propio las condiciones de su reproducción. Eh, o sea, el derecho eh, reside, la existencia del derecho reside en una relación entre el sistema y operaciones, un sistema que posibilita por las definiciones que contiene la, las operaciones, operaciones que por su parte tornan posibles el sistema. Pero voy a dar la palabra al profesor Luhmann para aprofundar este concepto. Esta idea ha sido prolongada por diversos autores, Teubner, Wilke y otros, y ha sido debatida por, eh, en muchos campos, dominios, por la dificultad que hace surgir en el pensar, la base de ese concepto, las relaciones entre la sociedad y el derecho, cómo se piensa esta relación, si se considera el derecho como un sistema que se produce a sí propio. Y esos debates tuvieron lugar en la Alemania, por supuesto, eh, entre otros lugares en la Zeit für Rechtssoziologie, intervieron eh, Rotleutner, entre otros también Blankenburg, que está aquí, y en otros países también, en particular en Italia, donde eh, el profesor Luhmann ha conocido el profesor Arnaud, que a partir de este eh, encuentro ha desarrollado también un trabajo crítico hacia la teoría de Luhmann, que está eh, en la base de este número especial de Droit y Société, donde se pueden encontrar las críticas de Arnaud a Luhmann y una respuesta, de, una contesta de Luhmann, una breve contesta de Luhmann, un último marco, diría, bibliográfico de este resumen. Bueno, no quería llevar más tiempo. Este debate aquí empezado va a continuar ahora y dejo la palabra por eso al profesor Niklas Luhmann. Gracias. Bueno, well, uh, when I... I need the, the microphone. Sorry, okay. sorry. <laughs> okay. When I chose the, the topic and the title of my lecture, I was not aware that this would be a summer school. Uh, so the idea was to have a discussion about a discussion or a follow up of this kind of discussion which I mentioned just ago. Just a moment ago. Therefore, I have some difficulties to adjust to this type of audience, and the way to do it was to distribute a paper which was not planned for this situation uh, in English, and to have a lecture which used the same theory, of course, uh, but in different terms so that you can read something about it uh, and hear a different version, not textually the same version, uh, orally. And the discussion can, of course, use the paper or the, uh, the oral presentation as a base. The, uh, the paper is difficult, uh, and there are even unnecessary difficulties in that uh, these are mistakes in spelling. I was not prepared to, to distribute it before, so uh, the library has exact indications of the mistakes, and there are two uh, bad ones. Uh, 
uh, if you have the paper on page three, in the first paragraph on the second last uh, line, there should be the system itself or some external unit, not of some external unit. And on page 10, in the second paragraph, uh, the fifth line from below, it should not uh, uh, mean resource to nature, but recourse to nature. So careful readers will have obviously seen already these mistakes. But I mentioned them, and if you have not the paper, you can go to the library and, and check the, the points. Well, the idea of the discussion was to center around a very difficult concept of operational closure related to the idea of autopoietic systems, self-reproducing systems, closed systems by the operation of producing the system with the means of the system itself. And this is a difficult concept, particularly because uh, it goes against very important, deep-rooted, traditional ways to, to make science or to, to describe the world. It goes against the subjectivistic tradition, the idealistic, transcendentalistic, or whatever, tradition of cognition, in the sense that cognition, uh, or observing and describing something, is not uh, the affair of a conscious subject alone, whatever the subject then means, the term subject, uh, but it is a, a real system and object which has the capacity to, to have cognition, to cognize and to describe and observe the environment, including biological objects like cells or immune systems or nerve systems and so on and so forth. So it is a complete, completely realistic theory, not an idealistic one, but taking into it the whole tradition of idealism by the idea of closure. It is a real system, but a closed system. That's, that's one of the difficulties. And the other is uh, that the empirical sciences normally operate with causal relations, causal laws or attribution of cause and effect. And this concept goes beyond any kind of causal statement so closure does not mean that there is no influence from the environment to the system or to the, from the system to the environment. There can be any kind of causal relations, interdependencies of all kinds of, uh, of uh, real uh, possibilities, but uh, the Closure, you can nevertheless talk about closure if you focus on the operations of the system as such. So I, I have the experience that it is completely uh, in vain, has no, no effect to make these statements in abstract. People uh, immediately, they, they understand it, but they don't follow. And, and if I talk about uh, later parts of in this lecture, uh, you will forget what I said in the beginning. So I, I start with the second uh, uh, remark, preliminary remark about the biological roots of the idea, because autopoiesis was a term uh, invented by Humberto Maturana, a neurophysiologist or biologist. And uh, also the idea of operational closure was very much uh, uh, stimulated by brain research. Because the brain is actually a 
not an open system, but a closed system. The electrical language of a brain can be used only within the brain. The brain has no, or the nervous system, has no access to the environment. It's completely closed, and closure in this sense is the condition of openness. And that's uh, the difficulty. Biologists normally are not aware of the uh, problematic they go into when they combine brain research or nervous system or describing the animal from a biological, biochemistical point of view or genetic point of view on the one side and the behavior on the other side. Because they, as biologists, would have to face the question, how comes that uh, an animal sees space, can observe other animals, can react on distance, although it has only a nervous system which is limited to observe the own organism. The nervous system is a self-observing part of the organism. And how is it possible to see space and time and movement, to see an other animal moving and seeing the identity of the animal in different parts of a space, of the outer world? So this is a general problem. Uh, how is it possible to have a, a closed system which nevertheless transcends its own boundaries but not in operating in, on, the, on the operational level, not in using its own operations to contact the environment, but somehow differently. I use this uh, paradigm of biological, uh, uh, animal, uh, biological uh, facts and uh, knowledge uh, not to make an analogy. My argument is not that because uh, the biology, the organisms have a certain structure, a certain way of reproducing themselves, therefore social systems have to do the same thing. It is not an argument, it is not a metaphorical use of biological terms, and it is not an argument by analogy. It is simply the, uh, the idea that there is a very general problem which is important for biologists and for sociologists as well. And the general problem is the problem of operational closure. I can formulate this uh, in a rather trivial way in saying that no system is able to operate outside of its own boundaries. It is, of course, a system can extend its boundaries, but it cannot operate in the environment. It can shrink or, or expand. Uh, like a communicative system, you can choose new topics or new persons to talk with but it cannot uh, operate outside of its own uh, boundaries. And this is quite evident, but the, the effects on traditional thinking are formidable. The effects on traditional thinking are revolutionary in a certain sense. And this is, well, the, the, the best way, I think, to introduce the topic of this lecture. How is it possible to, to uh, transcend the boundaries uh, without transcending them, to make it a paradoxical statement, to stay in the system and nevertheless have an access to the environment, to produce openness by closure. My attempt to answer this is uh, 
and I can make it, have it to make it very short, is uh, the idea that a system, at least these type of systems, are able to internalize the difference of internal and external. To use the distinction of system and environment within the system. They cannot operate in the environment, but they can use the distinction of system and environment to guide internal operations. There, there is a, in the uh, logic, which is not very known, or it's kind of algebra, arithmetic algebra, reconstruction of Boole's algebra uh, by somebody called Spencer Brown, George Spencer Brown. The references are in the text here. And he constructs uh, the uh, a logic of, of transforming distinctions, building up complexity by transforming distinctions, beginning with the kind of injunction, make a distinction, otherwise you see nothing if you don't distinguish what you want to see. Make a distinction. And the, uh, the uh, theory ends with the concept of re-entry. The distinction re-enters the distinguished. This is a mystical thing. I mean, he used the term, the, the idea of an imaginary space from mathematics to, to make this point, but uh, as soon as you introduce this uh, uh, into the uh, social system field, you see immediately yet that you can use the idea of re-entry because the distinction of system and environment can re-enter the system. Whatever the logical base of this thing, that's quite unclear, and we do a lot of work on this now in Bielefeld. But we are, it is clear that systems are able to, to, to uh, transform the, the original distinction, the discrimination, the drawing of a boundary into a distinction which they can use within the system. So re-entry uh, of a form into the form of a distinction into the distinction is the methodological a base idea of what I wanted to say now. I have to skip the epistemological side. I'm just going to publish a book on, on the science of the society, the science as a subsystem of society, where there are 700 pages on, on this kind of thing. Uh, the uh, essential point is that uh, philosophers uh, of the recent decades had, and also linguists and all kinds of semiotic writers, had the problem of reference how talking goes out of the words and into the reality, how there is a reference within the discourse, within the word of sociology, the language and whatever, to outside, how to come from the inside to the outside. And I replace this question completely, the question of roots of reference in the terms of Quine, by the uh, idea that the essential point is how a system handles the distinction between self-reference and external reference. How a system operatively handles the distinction between self-reference and external reference within a closed system. And you see this is another version of the uh, basic problem, how a closed system can construct openness. Now, the next step is to apply this to social systems in general and to society, the encompassing social system in particular. The main 
point is that we have to be very precise in defining what kind of operation constructs a system. What kind of operation fulfills the requirements of autopoiesis? What kind of operation makes the difference, makes, produces the difference between system and environment? Produces the difference between system and environment and secondly constructs this distinction as a guideline or a code for internal operations and then is able to simultaneously have two faces, one to the outside, one to the inside, self-reference, external reference. And my answer is communication. Communication is, would be the operation which produces the system out of its own means, that means produces communication by communication, and there's no other factor except communication producing and reproducing the system. Closure on the base of communication. And then to see how we have to understand communication if we want to use the term for this theoretical purpose, within this theoretical design. This again, I have to skip more or less. Uh, the, uh, the essential point is just to, to see communication not as an action of an individual, because then you have body and mind of an individual within your scheme, and you come not to say that communication is only a product of communication. So we have to avoid the idea of communicative action, and we have the, to avoid the idea of uh, transmission by communication. So it goes against uh, everything you read normally if you look uh, under the word communication. And it replaces this type of theory with the idea uh, that communication is a certain type of distinction. Certain type of distinction. If you have, uh, if you are perceive, if you perceive the behavior of other persons, you perceive the behavior, you see an object. But if you see communication, you see a difference. And this is the difference between utterance, expressive behavior on the one side, and information. So as soon as you observe somebody else, not how if he is beautiful or ugly, young or old, and, and how he behaves and how he, what kind of impression he conveys. But if you look with the help of the distinction, what does he mean in saying this? What is the information? And why? What kind of intention he has to say this now? As soon as you observe in this way, you observe communication. And only if you observe in this way, you can contribute to communication. And so there is a takeoff of a new level of reality, uh, communication as a continual, a continual movement to, to make a distinction and transform a distinction of utterance and information. So this is probably not understandable in this short, uh, short uh, version, but my intention is to write a theory of society on the basis of this uh, kind of communicative closure. The, the society is a system which closes on the basis of communication and reconstructs uh, the world because it includes the, the moment of information into its own operation. So it has an outside contact via information, which is constructed within the system, and it has self-reference in terms of utterance 
of the the operative part of the of the uh, communicative process. So the distinction of utterance and information is at the same time a reconstruction of the idea of self-reference and external reference. Now time is running and uh, I have to come to the uh, to the next step, if, even if you follow to this point, and if you accept the theory to this point, the most difficult things is to come. Because if we construct a society as a system closed on the operation of communication and open only within this context, how could we conceive of systems within the society also as closed systems. Can there be closed systems within closed systems? Can there be operational closure within a society? Could we have a operational closure on the level of the legal system, or on the level of science, or on the level of the economic system, even if already the society is a closed system? Or in other words, <clears throat> how are we to define the operation which closes a system within another system? There is similar discussion in, in biology uh, concerning, for example, brain research, because the neurons, the cells, are closed systems, and the brain is also a closed system, which works on the basis of cells but it has an own type of closure. And so the, uh, there again are similarities, but not analogical reasoning, uh, comparing living organisms and social systems on the other side. Then, of course, the question comes, uh, what is the type of operation which closes a legal system, and which makes it possible to go from one legal operation to a next legal operation, or to distinguish in uh, choosing to communicate within the legal system what is legally relevant and what is not legally relevant. And uh, we have a, the, the prime impression is, of course, the first impression is uh, that legal system should be able to distinguish legal questions and other questions. Somehow it is not going against uh, common sense to say that a, a judge must be able to say, well, this is not legally relevant and this is legally relevant. It is only unusual to see this process of this distinction of legally relevant, legally irrelevant as a productive process reproducing the system. But then, uh, how could we uh, describe this way of recognizing uh, operations which belong to the system and distinguish them or discriminate them uh, against uh, other operations which do not belong to the system? Originally, I thought, coming from a functionalist background, that function is the answer. We should define the function of the legal system and then see which kind of operations serve the function of the legal system. Then I did proceed to try to define the function of a system as, in this case, uh, stabilizing normative expectations in spite of possible disappointment. So the legal system produces counterfactual uh, expectations. They hold true, they, they are stable even if people act against them. And they are created precisely for this purpose. If nobody can act otherwise, uh, there's no point to make a norm. Norms are stabilizing improbable expectations, improbable structures, structures against which you can go 
but are not supposed to do it. And it builds the system on the level of these type of norms. This is the point I made in this book, uh, Rechtssoziologie. But then is this, is this sufficient to recognize uh, uh, the, or to make the distinction between the legal system on the one side and the environment on the other side? And I found, finally, no, it's not sufficient. Because it would not be suitable for the legal system always to control the function. Because if you have a function, you have a functional equivalence. You can ask uh, for other types of uh, performances which have the same function. So function is a much too open concept uh, to define the specific legal operations. So I was forced to look for other, in addition, not excluding the functional point of view, but in addition to look for other ways to define how a system, or to determine how a system recognizes its own closure and makes the distinction between internal and external. And the main idea is to use the concept of binary code, meaning that uh, always if, a if a, an operation, a communication, orients itself to the difference legally right, legally wrong, or legal, illegal, then the operation goes into the, is part of the legal system. If not, then not. If you think in terms of morally good or morally bad, this is not a legal distinction. If you think in terms of profitable, non-profitable, it is not a legal distinction. If you think in terms of, well, this is good for the opposition, this is good for the government, it's a political distinction, but not a legal distinction. So with the idea that there are many different function systems and many different binary codes in modern society, I think I'm able to, to define relatively clearly what kind of operations are uh, assumed to be legal one and how normal people, without turning to the difficult question of function, are able to make the distinction. For example, in, in marriage relations, family relations, uh, as soon as you say, well, if you act in this way, this gives a reason for divorce, then you are operating within the legal system because you use a legal term and the distinction right, wrong, uh, legal, illegal. But if you simply complain about the behavior of your husband or your wife, uh, then you are in the family system. And normally, there's, there's a very important empirical point in this uh, to see at what point operations tend to shift from everyday life or family life or commercial relations to legal problems. When people dare to ask the question juris, the, the legal question. And one of the experiences uh, I had with Roman law is that the fantastic capacity of Roman lawyers to have the question juris within a political system, within a political uh, system of political relevance and the question juris, the question of law was, was a uh, way to get out of politics and to go into a kind of structured, more structured uh, situation. So I think this, uh, this idea of which code you choose is uh, a very powerful uh, discriminator uh, in everyday life, not only in, in, in a scientific reconstruction of everyday life. And of course, it is possible to do empirical uh, research uh, on different countries, different times, different uh, situations. Uh, big business, for example, is very reluctant to pose the legal question uh, in one sense and to avoid, uh, and they have other ways to, to cope with uh, difficult problems. 
Then I need a third, uh, third idea uh, besides function and code. That is the actual state of the system. Because if you have the distinction right and wrong, this is too abstract. You have a concept like diverse or uh, well, contract or corporate law or some tax or something uh, which makes it possible to attribute the value, the positive value and the negative value to the uh, communicative, to the outcome of the communication. To say this is right, this is wrong, you have to have more than simply the distinction. The distinction is a, is a logically a symmetric situation. You can exchange the values. The negative value is not the positive value. And the negation of the positive value is the negative value. And this is completely open. So you need programs. And programs are always historically fixed things. So there is a continual reference to the actual state of the system with the help of the code and with the, with the idea of functional, functional differentiation. But the practical thing is to know what the law is and to know in which situation you can successfully uh, argue legally or not successfully. So there are actually three factors which uh, separate the legal communication uh, from political ones, economic ones. Uh, the function, the coding, and the reference to the, or the recursivity, the reference to the system which has produced itself and will reproduce itself further on. Well, I have two more points. Uh, one is, uh, how does the system handle, the legal system now, handle the difference between internal and external states? The system itself, self-reference and external reference. And in principle, I have two, two uh, different uh, answers. One on the operative level, then the system is, I use the formula, normatively closed and cognitively open. Normatively closed in the sense that on the level of norms, counterfactual expectations, expectations in face of possible disappointments, on this level, the system is closed. Only legal norms count. No moral norms, no, no technical uh, criteria, not, not problems of accounting in business except if a legal norm refers to them. So uh, it is normatively closed. And the only, only uh, system which achieves closure on the basis of norms is the legal system, not the moral system. We have no morally closed system. Morally Moral is a too weak and too fluid uh, way to uh, make points, to ha have positive and negative values. As soon as you achieve closure, the system becomes a legal system, independent of what kind of norms it is. Independence, it's not a, a, not a definition by content, by meaning. It is simply a de definition by form, by autopatic uh, closed forms, and then you can say a system is normatively closed, but cognitively open. Because uh, there are always facts are relevant for the system. Did uh, somebody kill somebody else? You will remark in the text that I use the phrase, if somebody kills another woman, to make a reflection about sexist terminology, uh, you are aware that somebody is another woman. But you are aware only uh, a little bit too late to understand the phrase. So uh, this is an example. And, and of course, whether this is uh, a fact or not 
is not normatively prescribed. So the system has a large part of the daily operations are cognitive. And in fact, most of the legal uh, problems or the legal procedures are decided on facts and not on norms. The interpretative part of a legal system is, is uh, well, 10%, 20% perhaps, but most of the legal issues are issues about facts, not about norms. This is one thing. You can say that uh, the distinction between normative and cognitive expectations are at the same time a distinction between self-reference and external reference. Then, uh, on a second level, a system observing or constructing its own way of operation, we have a different type of distinction within the legal dogmatics now between concepts and interests. The, you know probably the, the controversial issue, uh, Begriffsjurisprudenz, conceptual jurisprudence, or analytic jurisprudence on the one side, and interest jurisprudence uh, on the other side. It is very unhappy, suitable to scientific tastes, to have controversies on this issue. My point is that it is always simultaneously, you have two references on concepts and on interests not the one excluding the other, but continually uh, using, transforming the distinction of concepts and interests. So it is not a question of schools and of, of ways to construct legal dogmatics, but on the operative level, on the self-observation of a system, conceptual issues and interest issues are always uh, implied with of course, uh, different weight for the decision. Sometimes the interest is more important, sometimes the concept is more decisive. So I have two ways to reconstruct the difference of uh, internal self-observation, self-reference, and external reference within the legal system. And you see that I use a general, very general conceptual idea to construct specialties of the legal system, and I do the same thing for the economic system, for example, with the concept of transaction. I cannot go into this here now. And then the, uh, perhaps, a kind of relief comes from the last part uh, of the lecture, focusing on structural coupling. Structural coupling as a term which is compatible with closure, compatible with autopoetic autonomy, with autopoetic reproduction. But these systems operate as real system in a real world under real constraining conditions. And Maturana, it's the concept of Maturana, did a use the idea of structural coupling to uh, describe the relation of autopoetic, closed, autonomous living system to the environment. If we uh, use the same idea in, in social science, we have, of course, we need a type of clarification on the concept of structural coupling. Structural coupling means channeling influences. On the one side, uh, excluding a lot of influences of the environment on the system. And within a small range of allowed, permitted influences to increase possibilities. Again, a difficult two-phase concept of exclusion and inclusion, and increasement, increasing uh, power and increasing potential for building up complexity by excluding many other things. So for example, if you have a, the society as a communicative system, the structural coupling is consciousness. 
goes to consciousness. Because only conscious individuals can participate in communication. If there were, were no conscious, if consciousness would be destroyed by some kind of, of a catastrophe, communication would stop immediately. But the important thing is that nothing else can irritate, provoke, perturb uh, communication except consciousness. So the word has no direct access to communication except by consciousness. And consciousness, the individual consciousness, is not able to determine communication, but simply to irritate uh, the communicative system. This is a, an idea which is close to the concept of assimilation et accommodation uh, of Piaget. It's a closed system, but the system can take up irritations from the environment. It is not determined. No communication is determined is the threshold to determine when the open systems, which eventually would be common in the pre-modern society, become closed. There must be a critical threshold beyond which system becomes closed. And of course you say that moral, for instance, you just said, that moral is too weak to be a closed system. So I'd like to understand uh, this point. And this is related with this other question, well, that's the, actually the same question, is that if uh, the construction of the closed system is an historical construction, then we should allow for empirical gradation when we compare between different societies. But yesterday you said that Teubner, for instance, misunderstands you because he thinks that there can be more or less closeness or openness. In my view, Though I don't agree with Teubner, in this case, I think that he's probably right. And then what you would say is that if that is possible, then there are very closed systems for very closed societies. West Germany is probably the best example of a closed society and a closed system. But then all of our other societies would probably, would probably be less closed, more open. If we would accept this gradation, of course you said yesterday, yes, if they are more open, that means that they are less modern, pre-modern. Well, that's so. The first question is the question of uh, of how to come about for the closed system. Related to this is the one, is the following one. You assume that there is possible within the society as a closed system to have subsystems which are themselves closed. How we determine how many closed systems there are? Is it an empirical question? It is a question that we can ask in systemic terms, or we have to have an external theory, an external observer theory, in order to determine the types of subsystems that we can allow in society. And from there I go to the other questions, which is this one. If we assume, and I go along with you, I, you know, that this train station I still keep on going with you, so I'm not dropping out at this stage. Um, if we assume that all these subsystems are all of them closed and the society as such is a closed system that encompasses all the others, then society is not only closed, is empty. That is to say, doesn't produce any operation which is not included or produced by the subsystems. So far, closeness means emptiness. Then you say that, uh, of course, uh, and I, I, I grant that, I'm trying to go along with you, when you say that biologists don't like to conceive of society as a social, as a no-closed system, because they think that individuals are part of society. And you say individuals are not part of the system. I wonder whether biologists are better sociologists than the sociologists themselves. 
Because in fact, I can't imagine, I understand Maturana, and when I read Maturana, I never thought that you'd be reconstructed in the way that you did. Because of course, Maturana doesn't leave anything out that is important in his biological system. While you leave something that for some of us are very important, individuals, actions. So you say that you don't take Maturana analogically, nor metaphorically, but I would like you to respond to this crucial question. Maturana doesn't leave out the very important things, objects, whatever, that we call individuals. The final question is that structural coupling, of course, is the most complex element in your system and in Maturana Varela system. And I, I appreciate that you try to bring in some complexity and not, so, not only some simplicity, that th these systems have to interact. But then there comes a problem for me. The most interesting things in society, constitution, uh, pro property, contract, you have difficulties in locating them in one of the systems. And that's why you call them structural couplings. That is to say, the most crucial things in our society, for instance, in the modern state, constitutional states, the constitution, we, you are unable to locate them in one system. That is to say, the most important things in our societies stay in between the systems. Therefore, why to put so much emphasis on the systems? That would be my question. Well, perhaps I should start with a preliminary remark about systems theory, uh, which covers almost all of your questions. Systems theory is not a theory about specific objects called systems, but a theory about a specific distinction of system and environment. So uh, I'm talking about a distinction, not about certain types of objects. This is, uh, uh, has to do with certain methodological or uh, other logical uh, predilections for starting not with identities and unities, but with distinctions, with observers and observers using distinctions. So this is just, uh, I come back to this uh, at a certain point. Um, the first questions, there were actually two. Uh, the transition from openness to closure. I do not conceive of evolution or transition as a transition from openness to closure. But I see the problem, the similar problem, in a slightly different way, how it is possible within an encompassing system of society to to develop closure. All systems are closed systems. All systems have, all social systems have to construct openness on the base of closure. Otherwise, if you have an open system, what is the system? How is the system able as a unit to, to be open, to be open? You need something like closure to identify the system on the base of its own operations. So there is no movement from open systems to closed systems, but there is the question, what are the historical preconditions uh, for closing a system? One example is to read uh, Savigny's uh, System des Bürgerlichen Rechts, uh, the first volume and the first pages. There Savigny says that uh, if a jurist uh, find norms to make decisions, they are always already there. He, of course, used the term folk, folk to, to say a folk has this his uh, own norms, and later lawyers find out what it is, describe it, describe it, and, and 
make codes on this and so on and so forth. This is exactly the problem. What uh, are the pre-adaptive advances in a society which make it possible to suddenly close a system in the sense, relatively suddenly close the system in the sense that lawyers are supposed to treat only legal texts. And if they have uh, common law traditions, they need a stare decisis uh, or precedent cult to, to, uh, to, to know what is legal, what is not legal. And uh, of course, customary customs become law by being recognized by the courts. So the question is, uh, to what ex how, what kind of development uh, uh, has to be done, what has to happen already, that for whatever reason in, in a historical situation, closure is possible. There's a, there were very interesting discussions and, and uh, investigations about the Greek science, the problem of Greek science before Euclid and, and and what makes it possible that methods are conceived, that you should methodologically control whether something is true or wrong. They need a long tradition of discussion and controversies before science, and then science uh, uh, in the medical field, partly in the, in the, in the economy and the agriculture, partly in the, in the mathematics, and so closed uh, on the level of methods. and and on the idea that we have to decide about two values, true or untrue, and this is science. But the magic tradition, all this kind of controversy, continue for, for centuries and, and, and uh, almost 2,000 years after the first closure of science. So this is the, the type. Uh, and I don't need the Teubner idea that uh, there is some in-between form, half closed, half open, or, or half autopoietic, or more autopoietic, less autopoietic. This is, this is not possible to do this with the strict concept of autopoiesis. But it is possible, nevertheless, to see, to make historical analysis on the pre-adaptive advances. And also, if I would, uh, if there were, would, be, would be possible to, to have a theory about the evolution of language, there were also similar considerations, for example, that uh, the first preconditions, of course, that you have a situation in animals with, with uh, highly individualistic animals and social dependence at the same time. And then you need a system of science to convey, uh, well, I'm this and this animal, and, and uh, you should better pay attention to me and not to other animals. Uh, so there are preconditions, structural preconditions, for developing of artificial exchange of signs and finally then language. And it will be difficult to say at what time, at what uh, certain point in history language comes about so that you use linguistic means all the time. But the, the, the idea is clear, I think, and it's not, it does not ex exclude any kind of evolutionary uh, explanation. Then the, uh, the question of, of uh, subsystems, well, this is the point I made in the lecture. Uh, I think of modern society as defined or characterized by functional differentiation and a functional differentiation as characterized by closure of function systems. Of course, there can be other theories, but this is my theory. And I try to, to see what I can see with this type of theory. It is not totalitarian in the sense that I don't admit other possibilities. I would be glad to see other possibilities on the level of this kind of ambitious theory to uh, a theory of modern society, but okay. So uh, there is no answer uh, with respect to the question how many functional systems there are. It is not a Parsonian type of theory where you deduce four and have to go to a different level of theory to have another four or 16 then and so. 
And partly uh, working with Parsons made it clear to me that I could never construct a theory which predicts the number of function systems. But I have, a cri I have criteria to, to describe uh, the conditions under which a function system would be closed. And this is mainly binary coding, also second order observation, which I didn't mention in the lecture. And then we can, of course, have questions, for example, are mass media today a function system? Do they have binary codes? In the sense, for example, information relevant, information not relevant. Is this a code like true, untrue? Do they have second order observation? Are they always observing observers within the same system? Do they have mechanisms for uh, making the distinction of self-reference and external reference or not? And so I have a list checking going through the, the uh, and then I, I have to decide after some type of research whether I could say sports, mass media, health, are function systems or not. And historically, it's open. There can be new function systems. Religion was perhaps the first one, political system the second, or economy at the same time, science came later, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, it depends on, a, on, a, on, a, on the degree of elaboration of a theory for criteria, what is, are the requirements of closure? Why are we coding morals is very clear? Morally wrong or right? Why is that not a system? Well, because uh, this a moral system could not think of an environment without morality. You could not, uh, at least as far as I know ethics, and the literature never says we are moral and the environment is an neither moral nor immoral. This is an archaic type of thing. Our, our tribe is moral, uh, and everything is uh, outside of morality. But in modern society, I don't think that uh, you could make a distinction of system and environment. Uh, one system has the, the uh, code moral, immoral, and everything else is outside of the code. You say all society is moral, but everything which is outside of the system of society can be a moral? Yeah, well, of course, uh, the, the society as such is a moral, is a, can use the moral distinction. Uh, and in this sense, uh, of course, society is differentiated uh, with different types of codes, under them the moral code. But uh, it could not be a, sub a functional subsystem within the society. I think that's an empirical question. If somebody shows that um, there is one moral system and everything else in the society has nothing to do with morality, uh, so as we have uh, an economic system and everything else which doesn't use money has nothing to do with the economy. So I don't think that, uh, uh, that morality can... But this is, in my view, an empirical question. If I, I simply don't see it, but I, maybe I you can convince me that there is a moral system as a subsystem of society. Another question relating to this. Could you give a historical point where law has differentiated as a closed subsystem, as a closed system? When did it close? When did law as a self-referential system start historically? I think uh, the civil law of Roman, the Roman Republic would be the best answer. Uh, but uh, I have some doubts about uh, the Greek case, the Athenian case. I mean, if you read in Aristotle, in the rhetorics, for example, that uh, the distinction of legislation and adjudication uh, has uh, the purpose, the function of neutralizing tribal influence of of aristocracy on the, on the decision of the courts. Because you cannot, you cannot uh, recognize the interests of your friends on the level of, of legal 
legal decision statutes because they are too general. And if the judge obeys to the law, then he cannot uh, privilege, prefer his friends. This type of argument is an argument of closure, of closure by a specific distinction. So it depends on the, uh, to have a very clear conceptual idea about the preconditions of closure and then go into the historical material to see, uh, at least on the level of literature, um, when uh, closure comes about. And it was also in Euripides, for example, in the, in the tragedies, there are texts which say that uh, the distinction of, of, of rich and poor uh, do not matter in uh, legal affairs. The poor can have, uh, get a positive uh, uh, estimation in, in the courts. He can have success in courts if he has right. Then, of course, the question whether this is, describes this is the real state of society or it's a wishful uh, hope. Uh, but then you see uh, the conditions of closure uh, and also the the uh, the tragedies are the Greek tragedies are very interesting on this point of view that right and wrong exclude each other and are not combined like uh, in the uh, RSD and all these kind of tragedies that if you are insisting on your right you are wrong and this of course is a pre legal attitude a religious one you should not insist on your right because they are gods and you don't know how they treat you if you are too stubborn in insisting on your rights. So uh, it's better to be a little bit uh, cautious for religious reason. And then, you, of course, you cannot have a legal thing. But uh, there are some remaining questions. I would not say that society is empty because everything is done in other systems. Because the, the uh, Criteria is not the object society, but the distinction between system and environment. And society produces by separating out communication as a special sphere. sphere. Uh, and this cannot be done in any kind of subsystem. And subsystems have to prove their belonging to society by using communication. And the distinction of communication and not communication is a uh, well, achievement of, of, uh, of the societal system. So in this sense, it is not, uh, it uh, creates the precondition of building systems within systems by throwing the environment out. Then uh, the same type of, of uh, general idea to answer your question whether I leave out individuals. No, I simply say they are in the environment. This does not mean that they are irrelevant. They have simply a position not in the system. They are part of the environment and I use always the distinction system environment. And it is for me impossible to be, have a precise conceptual apparatus taking the individuals into the system because then all kind of biochemistry. If you need go to, uh, well, somebody uh, cutting your hair, he's cutting something off the society. Uh, this is uh, uh, very improper to have a precise idea of society uh, by taking the individual into, into the system. And I have only the other possibility, either system or environment. There is no third possibility, nothing in between. And this is the hard decision. There's nothing in between. There's no third position. They get, they get my head. Is that not an operation of the system of communication and address and the reference and the information? There is not that. Thing. Well, of course, you need, you need communication to to kill people or to change their bodies and somehow you need communication and this is uh, uh, then uh, if I go to the to the uh, hair dresser, then he asks me uh, how do you want it done and I say normally silent uh, so this is communication 
and uh, the idea of communication then for you is to speak to oneself. Yeah, it's mostly uh, language or, or bodily language or all kind of indirect communication, but uh, always using the distinction between information and utterance. of a system relative to an environment. I'm not sure, and maybe I just don't understand the system theory, why outside of systems there aren't other systems. If there is this environment, which is not systems, that is, it can be spoken of, as you have today, independent of systemic relations, then why couldn't it be studied unsystematically or as a non-systematized Activity. It seems more consistent to say only that there are systems and other systems rather than that there are systems and environments because I'm not sure what this environment is if it isn't a collection of systems and if it's a collection of systems then it seems important to remain consistent in that language which would then produce a, a research question that was always connecting a situation to another system rather than to this sort of formless realm. Well, perhaps uh, I have to say first that I'm not normally not thinking in terms of collections of objects, but in terms of distinctions, again. And uh, so uh, the distinction environment, system environment, has, of course, needs a system reference from what kind of system you look at the environment. And the environment is then everything else excluded from the system. And within the environment, there are other systems, but there are many things which are probably not systems, and uh, so they are simply, uh, simply facts or relations or whatever. I mean, if it's not a social environment, but a physical, I'm not too aware that I need to construct the, the environment as a collection of systems. Uh, Secondly, the, uh, within the environment are systems which have their own environment. And the system we start with is a system in the environment of other systems. So if we uh, have a theory which tries to trace the possibility of observing observers, or the whole problem of intersubjectivity and so, how could I observe a system and observing that the system observes me. Uh, and then I have to single out uh, one system uh, and uh, this is, by the way, the, the uh, topic of Pirandello's uh, uno, nessuno, centomile uh, thing. I mean, uh, the observer is, I'm observing one, but uh, he's observing me or nobody and if then Hundred thousand. If you finish the question. Yeah. No, I, I think actually he did not finish that uh, one. There is one, one more remaining question. Remaining question. Uh, uh, yeah. That is the question of the uh, how much it could puzzle the sociologists of law to see that uh, most of the most important objects uh, we yeah. are preoccupied mm -hmm. with. Uh, as, for yeah. instance, constitution, and here in Spain it's mm -hmm. quite an important matter, remain between yeah. the mm -hmm. systems. And I, I uh, would like to connect this question with, uh, with another question related to the question of the individuals, because perhaps one way to reintroduce the individual within this model could be to consider the individual com uh, s like something like a complex structural coupling between law, economic, and politics through the figures of citizen, uh, rechtssubjekt, uh, and owner. Mm. 
But in this case, there's one more very important reality of the contemporary yeah. uh, times, who remains between systems. Mm. Well, if I uh, stay by, with my stubborn opinion to be very hard on distinctions, there is no in-between. So uh, the Constitution is not in between the political system and the legal system, but it has a different meaning for the legal system and for the political system. That's why it's that. No. It can belong to both. Huh? It can belong to both, and, and uh, there is a kind of uh, position in which uh, the ambiguity of uh, membership in both systems uh, is a, a an important category in this in this kind of theory. So, for example, a, a payment can be a legal act. You have no debts anymore if you pay, and an economic act. But the precondition and the consequences are different in both systems. In the economic system, the receiver can do something with the money. Uh, in the legal system, uh, he has no longer a right to ask for the money. And the conditionings are different according to which, what kind of system is uh, meant. So an observer can always say it is the same act. Paying is uh, fulfilling an obligation and transporting economic possibilities from one position to another one. An observer can identify this, but if he looks at the systems, he sees that the system have different ways to identify events. And the same thing with structure. An observer can say a constitution is the same, a text which is the same in the political system, they read the same text. Therefore, the constitution is the same in the legal system and in the political system. But uh, if you look at the political use of constitution and the political consequences of use or misuse of constitution, then you have a complete different picture. Uh, if you look at the, at the constitutional court and the questions of uh, And then you have again, for example, in the United States discussion about original intent, you have again a mixture of legal and political issues on the second level of interpretation. Uh, but if you cannot distinguish, at, as modern participants in system, if you cannot distinguish the political and the legal issue, you are simply, you don't understand what has happened. I mean, Professor Luhmann, if the Constitution is both part of the legal system and the political system, both being closed systems, how can it operate as a structural coupling and any other law can't operate as a structural coupling? Why do you privilege Constitution as a structural coupling and not any normal law? Because uh, the effect, there is the effect of increasing irritation and excluding other sources. A constitution works only if it effectively channels political influence on the legal system and legal influence on the political system. The abortion laws, they irritate quite a lot politically. It's not a constitutional law, abortion law, for instance, in society. They irritate quite a lot the system. Well, in a sense, the, the, because it's only because the political system can decide to change the law. And the legal system is, is uh, sensitive to political conditions of changing the law if they use legislation. So if there were no legislation on abortion laws, there would be no political issue. Or in other words, if there were no positive law, there would be no democracy. I have a, a very short question. I have, the difficulty with reading Luhmann or discussing with Luhmann is that you can follow the train of thought to a certain point and then you, of course, you start predicting what next would he would say or write and then your prediction is wrong. And then the, these are points of, of surprise. Now you wonder why does he say this at the moment and couldn't he have said something else?
Now, I, I want to try out one of these points. The operation which constitutes society as a self-referential system, you say is communication. Well, the, I think it's a possible construction, but couldn't you also use another construction? Wouldn't it, leading to other results, be just as possible, but then you'd have another theory? And, and one, just to make it concrete, I would propose taking morals, moral judgment. Something can be moral or not moral. It's a bi binary decision. And couldn't society be self-referential on the basis simply of moral judgments? And what is not moral judgment cannot belong to the social system. Well, in principle, I... Uh admit on all kinds of stages or phases or degrees of abstractness or concreteness of the theory alternatives. This is part of functional addiction. If I have a problem, say a problem how to start a theory with difference or with identity, with a unit or with a distinction. Then of course I start with a distinction but uh, I admit by having the problem how to start a theory that somebody else could start with it. Of course. Uh, but, and this on every level of the theory, but then uh, there are standards of comparison. Uh, you should be on the same level of efficiency, on, on the same level of ambition. You should, if you want to draw another theory on the same level of ambition, it should be a universal theory talking about the society as a total uh, totality of all kinds of social operations, and so on and so forth. It should, should take into account the same phenomena like self-reference. The society is a self-describing system. You can do a lot with morality, uh, but uh, I think uh, what Nobody has actually done this job, uh, and I think he will get into difficulties uh, concerning the two things. Uh, first, there are other codes which are inherently amoral, not immoral, but uh, amoral, metamoral, in the sense that uh, we would not accept uh, uh, a morality which says the governing party is good and the opposing party is bad morally or vice versa. So they need a dis dissoci we need a dissociation of different codes against morality. And with the moral concept of society, we would have difficulties too. And then a second uh, question is uh, that a moral code needs programs which decide uh, which operation is good or which state or which person or whatever is good and which is bad, which locates the values to, it connects values and operations. And my impression is that modern society is very easy in using a code, moral, to say this is good, this is bad, everywhere, but had difficulties in, in producing consensus on the program, on the conditions uh, under which something is good or bad. And as we know from, from law, from economy, there has to be, or from science, there has to be a, a tight relation between coding and programming. Because without uh, conditioning the distribution of values, uh, we have no, no use for the code. And the present situation in morality and ethics is, I think, just this, this difficulty to uh, fast spread use of good and bad as a personal opinion or group opinion, but uh, high, difficulty, high difficulties in, in uh, having consensus on this problem side. So these are reasons why I'm skeptical if somebody comes and says uh, he would use morality uh, instead of communication uh, as a starting uh, term. But uh, I'm always looking if somebody's coming and uh, <laughs> challenging the theory on whatever kind of, of level. And actually, we have a lot of discussions in Bielefeld why to start with a distinction 
of system and environment. Why not with the distinction of medium and form? Or with the distinction of operating and observing? Operating, making a difference, observing, distinguishing what is differentiated. Are these not more fundamental than system and environment? Given the, the starting uh, idea that you have to start with a distinction, if you question this one, then uh, of course you you are old European in my terminology. <laughs> I am very sorry, can't stay here very much longer because uh, the staff can't uh, um, remain here until. But of course, of course, <laughs> I give the word to. <laughs> Not necessary. Last last question, but it was just about um, this encounter. This discussion about distinctions and binary codes is it can be com confusing, just as your definition of systems, because the the same word or the same concept is used at various analytical levels. One is your choice of how to start a theory, and you insist in the face of these questions to start with distinction and thus build from there as opposed to identity or, or other um, ways to go. Well, rather than ask you about why you start with distinction, I wanted to move to your discussion of binary codes in law. And if we look at legal systems in the expansion and the contraction of boundaries for whatever purpose, be it reproduction or put that aside, on what basis do you, do you hold on to the view that the code is binary? Or, or what of the possibility, which I think there is empirical evidence for, that in fact it can't be binary in order to expand out? For example, family. The, the discussion you, you had about what is in the family system versus the legal system. In the area of family law, you have the appropriation by law of all sorts of stuff coming from social workers that we about family. And so that it seems to me that the, the binary code that you have assigned for all systems to define their boundary is rather restrictive and may empirically have some problems. So tell us why you like binary codes. Well, on one level, there are very general advantages in binary codes or binary distinctions in building up complexity. Uh, this was also a Parsonian argument, for example. Uh, I don't know whether he wrote it down, uh, but he was very explicit about it. <coughs> and uh, this means that I have doubt whether you could uh, build complexity by prolonging the list of values in the sense that there is a value of uh, right or legally right, legally wrong, and useful or beautiful, elegant, an elegant construction uh, in legal terms. Could you have a list of uh, right, legally right, legally wrong, useful, politically convenient, elegant? Or what I prefer to say they are strictly binary codes, but then all kinds of values which are not in the code can come up, can take into account on the level of programs. So there can be programs, for example, in Israel, in the constitutional law of Israel, there is the, the I don't know, open or hidden, it's, uh, anyway, it's not written down, uh, that military uh, problems have an, an priority. But then, this is not uh, legally right, legally wrong, and military necessary, but on the level of programs, there's a priority of military uh, considerations. For example, in taking a new land uh, for settlements, they have to say for military purposes, not for religious purposes. 
Uh, but this is a question of program, not a question of, of uh, code. So I make uh, actually three important distinctions. One is self-reference, uh, external reference, and the binary code is exclusively internal. That means legally wrong is not the environment. Legally wrong is an attribute of the system itself. And then the binary code, and then the distinction of code and program. So this is a rather uh, embedding into a system of different distinctions, and but uh, always it is a distinction with two sides and not with three or four or five sides. It, this is not at all to interrupt the discussion, but we have to reorganize ourselves because the interpreter has to go right now. So if there are one or two other questions, of course we can discuss it a, f a few minutes, not very more, much more, because I think the staff uh, can't, uh, we can't uh, uh, expect from the staff to stay here uh, very longer, but uh, we had to translate the question uh, if necessary, it is possi possible, of course. Muchas gracias. Bueno, se tiene que hacer la advertencia en las próximas reuniones. Gracias. Well, perhaps we can end the session at this point. Thank you very much to Professor Niklas Luhmann for having made this speech and participate in this discussion. And thank you very much to all of you to have participated in the debate. Good afternoon. Ich glaube auch für Leute, die, ich würde sogar sagen, sie nie gelesen haben, mhm. äh, war durchaus das Nötige vorhanden, um der ganzen ja. Sache zu folgen. Mhm. Also ich bin natürlich nicht unbedingt äh, gut, also mein Stand ist mit nicht unbedingt repräsentativ, aber ja, ja. das ja, habe ich das Glück gehabt. Mhm. Es ist auch gut, dass ich also die, die Einführung also völlig frei und, und unabhängig von von dem Text selbst gemacht habe. Dann ja, das ja, 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 das, das, das hat das Ganze gut äh, für die Leute was sehr günstig. Gut, dann hole ich meine Tasche um. Ja, also wir würden, wir würden am selben Ort essen, wo wir schon gestern gegessen ah, haben. Ja. Wir ja. werden dort uns zu sieben oder acht treffen mit den Leuten, die, die Sie am ersten Abend kennengelernt haben und die mhm. auch hier waren jetzt. Gut. Das Taxi holt uns am selben Ort ab wie gestern. Dann Gut, können ja. wir uns gar dort an der Türe treffen. Wir treffen uns an der, an der hinteren Tür. Ich muss Tür. nämlich auch noch ja. einige Sachen ja. holen. Ich muss, darf nicht vergessen, Ihnen den Schlüssel zum ja, ja. Zimmer wieder Den geben Sie mir dann nachher, wenn ja. Aber es stimmt. Ja. Ich hole alle Sachen raus. Und, äh Gut. Dann wir treffen uns an der Tür. Ja.